Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Saving Grace Lutheran Church on this uh, Ascension Sunday of our Lord. Uh, many of you may know that during the church year, 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, which is a Thursday. So we usually pass by Thursday without remembering it. But this Sunday, we remember the ascension of our Lord as he returned to the heavens after he came as our Savior. And so my prayer for you today is, as we take a look, we're going to continue our look at First Peter. But as we do, we see that the Lord has not left us, but really given us a sense of of belonging, as he has called us not only to be his children, but be to, to be a part of his church as well. This morning we will follow the order of service as you have it printed out for you in your bulletin. Before we jump in and join together in singing our opening hymn, let's greet one another as we've come together as a family of Christ to praise our Lord today. This morning let's lift our voices and sing to our Lord in the words of like the golden sun ascending, Hymn number 470 in Christian worship. Let's join together in singing hymn number 470, Like the Golden Sun Ascending. service as you have it printed for you in your bulletin and let's join together in the response of confession and forgiveness please stand we begin this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. 
We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done and have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. Take a few moments of silence for meditation and reflection. The good news of the gospel is this, that God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all of our sins. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. Let's join together in singing our praise to our Lord and glory to God in the highest, Gloria and Excelsis. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, King of glory, on this day you have ascended far above the heavens and at the God's right hand you rule the nations. Leave us not alone, we pray, but grant us the spirit of truth that at your command and by your power we may be your witnesses in all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, at this time, we turn our attention to the words of our Lord for this Ascension Sunday. Our first lesson is Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days 
and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the time or dates the Father has sent by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 10. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our gospel lesson is taken from Luke 24, verses 50 to 53. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Thank you, Mr. Gallon. At this time, I'd ask for the children to come forward for a message intended especially for them. We got one more coming up. Hey, bud, how you doing? Come on. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, that's good. Let's try it again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow, you guys are almost done with school. Some of you are done with school already. Yeah, getting really close. Summer's coming up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, this morning, oh, shucks. Somebody's, somebody's not in a good mood today. Uh, this morning in church, we, we heard a reading in our gospel, and I hope you guys pay attention when we have our, our, our people at church uh, read those off. And it was about the ascension of Jesus. Have you ever heard that one before? Yeah. 
So uh, the gospel writer Luke, that was our gospel. He had just a little portion on there where he said that Jesus ascended back up into heaven. And then he also wrote the book of Acts, and he had a whole bunch of that. That was the longer section that we read where he talked about how Jesus went up into heaven. Now, imagine this. You guys have probably said goodbye to somebody before, right? Like maybe your grandma and grandpa came for a visit, and then they leave. What's the general mood when you say goodbye to someone? Yeah. Yeah, okay, disappointed, right? Yeah, something like you, you don't want them to go, right? Yeah, yeah, if, if a good friend is over playing and, and then they have to go home, you, sometimes a little bit sad, right? That's fair to say when you say goodbye to someone. Yeah, now listen to what Luke says, though. So here, here Jesus, the Savior of the world, is leaving everyone and going back to heaven. You would think that everyone would be a bit upset, right? Like, no, Jesus, don't go. But look at, look at what he says. It says, Luke wrote this in, in chapter 24. When he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, kind of like we do at the end of the church service, he left them and he was taken up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Now, do you think they were really happy because Jesus finally left? Like, phew, okay, now we can do whatever we want to. No. Why do you think they were happy? Good question. Okay, he rose from the dead, right? See, did, did he really leave them? Why not? That's right. That's why, that's why they weren't upset with him, right? Sometimes we do this, like if somebody leaves, we'll give them a picture. Like if Jesus had just gone and he had given them a picture of himself, right, that, that would be one thing. And, and they maybe would be sad because they're like, oh, all we have is this picture. But he gave them something more. Now the problem with this, like if Jesus had just given them a picture, if you were just standing there and you didn't hold it up, and I said, okay, here, here's, Jesus is leaving, he's giving you a picture. Oh, well, that's not going to stick with you very well, is it? No, no, we need something else. See, Jesus did one more thing, and he even promised it. He even promised it uh, that the Holy Spirit would come. And this is what he did. In order that we might know that Jesus is with us, even though he's, he left, he, he sort of like a piece of tape came, and then he stuck himself right there, right? Now, I know that looks a little funny, so I'll take that off. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, what do you think the tape is that keeps Jesus with us? How does the Holy Spirit work? What do we have in our hands that's in our heart? What can we put in our hands that faith comes from, the Holy Spirit works through, that talks all about Jesus all the time? The Bible, right? Yeah. So just like Jesus didn't just leave and give us a picture, but he also made sure that that picture of Jesus is continually in our hearts, right? Yeah, there you go. You can keep that picture. Now, I'm going to do the same thing. What I want you guys to know is that sometimes Jesus, we, we don't always see him, but just like the glue on the back of the stick it note, yeah, that is like the Bible making sure that Jesus is in your heart. You like that? I just, the only thing I thought about this morning is how cool it would be to put stick it notes on all the kids, and that's why I was doing that, okay? So now you guys kind of know how important it is and why we can be happy even if Jesus isn't here because we have the Bible, which keeps Jesus as a part of us, and we never forget that he is with us. There you go. You want one too, Anna? <laughs> All right, let's pray. <laughs> Dear Jesus, uh, thank you. Even though we know you're in heaven, you are right here with us. Thank you for giving us your word, which through the Holy Spirit works, builds faith in our hearts, so that when we think of you, we are not sad because we don't say goodbye, but you're constantly with us. Let that be our strength, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. All right, thanks for coming up, everybody. You can keep that sticky note. Wasn't that nice? This morning, let's lift our praise to our Lord, and we're going to join together in singing our psalm of the month.
Psalm 27b, O Lord, you are my light. That's on page 134 in the Christian Worship Psalter. That's the gray hymn book. Let's join together in singing, O Lord, you are my light. Uh, Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 27b. My family in Christ, good to have you in the house of God this morning as we celebrate Ascension Sunday. Um, on Thursday, 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended back into heaven and his disciples watched him go. And it actually serves as a fairly good introduction as we continue our look at 1 Peter as our sermon series on 1 Peter. Because as we do, we see Peter, and remember he was there that day as they watched him ascend into heaven. He hadn't quite gotten things right. The disciples were still a bit confused, and yet uh, 30 years later now, Peter jumps in and he, he writes by the power of the Holy Spirit, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, probably shortly before he was to die in Rome for his faith. And as he does, we see this, this sense of belonging that comes out. I'll, I'll explain a little bit. Uh, we've been following along in 1 Peter. We're now on 1 Peter chapter 2, and if you brought your Bibles along, great. I'll remind you again to bring them along with. Otherwise, follow along in your bulletin as well. And as Peter does, he's writing to all of Christendom at this point, a letter of encouragement to places that he'd never been before. Interestingly enough, Peter starts out in 1 Peter, um, and he doesn't really sell it as, as Christianity. He starts out by saying, um, you know, the, the, he starts out by saying, uh, the Lord has chosen you, and by his grace, uh, you are a child of God, which is a good thing. And then he says, you're going to suffer because this world is broken and it's far from perfect no matter what it is. And then on chapter, at the end of chapter 1, he throws on top of that, not only are you going to suffer, but be holy as the Lord your God am holy. Now, you all know that 
when we are suffering and sick or anything else. It's not our best times in the world to come out. So Peter is saying, if you're a Christian, you're going to suffer. God still wants you to be perfect. And if this was an advertisement that we're putting up for come to the church on Facebook page, it would not be very inviting, right? But he goes on at the end of chapter 1 and now chapter 2 with two solid reasons why our faith is worth it. At the end of chapter 1, he says, first of all, because Christ paid the price, his precious blood, so that you are bought with his blood. And then secondly, as we go into it, he says not only that, it's not just about your faith with your Lord, but you have also been called into his church, a, a living stone as a part of his bigger community, if you will. And what that brings is not just salvation, but a sense of belonging. Uh, let me uh, just point out how important this sometimes is. I, I know that um, when we look at, e even in our congregation, I, uh, we, we talk about different churches and different sizes uh, offer different things, but one of the reasons I think why a lot of people like our church is probably that sense of belonging. We're small enough, we can know everyone, people enjoy being a part of our fellowship. It's not so big that you kind of are lost, and we like that sense of fellowship. I even remember when uh, I first came, this was five years ago, can you imagine I've been here for almost five years, and I was asking everybody, you know, where do you, would you see Saving Grace Lutheran in five years' time? Now, COVID came along and kind of messed all that up. Uh, somebody asked me, though, they said, well, Pastor, where do you see Saving Grace? And I said, well, you know, I'd, I'd like it to grow. I'd like it to, to be bigger, more resources, uh, able to reach out to more people with the gospel, and I, I'd like to see us grow bigger. And someone told me, no, Pastor, we do not want to see our church grow. Now, I understood what they meant. What they meant was we didn't want to lose that sense of belonging, right? So here, Peter, in uh, uh, the second chapter, in these verses, and I'm going to focus in just on verse uh, 9 and 10, really gives us an understanding of the precious nature of us belonging and how God has called us, and, and not just left us on our own, but made us a part of his bigger community so that we might declare his praises. Let me read for you, and I'll point your attention to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, but I'm just going to read verse 9 and 10, probably verses you've heard before, uh, but really the, the center and the core of this next section of Peter. Peter writes this, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So far the word of God. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, strengthen us in your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Uh, I, I don't think it's unusual for us to realize that belonging uh, is, is important. I just, I just heard this on the news the other day, one of the major news stations, and they said that the, the opposite of belonging, which would be probably loneliness, has become a major factor in healthcare across the United States. I can't remember what report I saw, but they had quoted the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and they pointed out that a third of adults over the age of 45, so that's us old people, but I'm guessing it happens to young people too, but a third of them are considered to be isolated, not just lonely, but actually isolated. And they predict that it will affect health care over the next several years because loneliness has actually become a clinical thing now in our country. They say that you have a 50% higher chance of, of, coming, of, of dementia if you are isolated or lonely. Uh, the risk of heart disease, stroke, depression, and anxiety all come up because of loneliness. Now, we don't always think about that, but they said that this is part of what is affecting us. Yeah, so the opposite of that is just how important belonging is. And I think this is why Peter, remember he is writing to the Christians of his day, to us as well, but he's writing to those that are, are going to be somewhat cut off and isolated because of their faith. They're different than the rest of the world around them. And so as he points out the beauty of our salvation through Christ, what he also does is remind us that we are also built together with community. We're not on our own. And he goes all the way back to the Old Testament. In fact, all the way through Peter, and especially in this chapter, he's quoting verse after verse from the Old Testament. But Peter really goes on a theme that starts all the way back in Exodus 19. 
Uh, in fact, if you do have your Bibles, write this in Exodus 19 because this is what he uh, refers back to. You'll find that in your sermon notes as well. At one point, the first time that God gathered all of his people together in a large group was after they had come out of Egypt. He had delivered them with his power and with his grace from the slavery that they were in. You remember this? And then he brings them out to Mount Sinai, and for the first time, God comes down in his power and his glory on Mount Sinai, and they, he tells the people, don't touch the mountain. Here's my power and glory. I'm perfect and you're sinful. And yet at that point, this is what he told Moses to say before he even gives the Ten Commandments and all that other stuff. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, he says, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Right? Doesn't this sound like what Peter was saying? Uh, Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. See, but here's the crazy part now. So Peter having been Jewish, says this to everyone who has been called to faith in Jesus, right? So whether Jew or Gentile, we now are all a part of God's nation corporately because we have been called into that faith. Now, what does he mean by that? I mean, after all, I didn't grow up in Palestine. I don't know any Egyptians. So how, how does he relate God's promise in the Old Testament to us today? Well, he, here's what he's saying. If we are a Christian, we have been saved from some sort of slavery, right? The slavery of sin, maybe it's the slavery of self, living only for ourselves and looking out only for ourselves. Maybe it's the slavery of power, money, ambition, laziness, whatever it may be, but God has saved us from that slavery. And now what he says is this, not only have I come to you and and grabbed hold of you and given you faith in your Lord, but I have also made you a part of, of a corporate nation. I've also made you a part of a bigger group of people. I've built you as living stones into what we usually call as a spiritual house, a church, right? It's not just that we are saved. It's not just about our relationship with our Lord, but also that he has placed us together with Christians and another group of people in a church. Now, Sometimes I think that we, we think about church a little bit differently, um, and, and, and maybe it's just because of the community or, or, the, uh, or the culture that we're in. Sometimes it becomes a, a little more like a consumer-based thing. Uh, we sometimes look for churches for those things that we like best, and we have to admit, even in our own church, we look for things that we like best. Maybe it's children's programs, one thing or the other, and I think the tendency is to kind of look at it from a consumer-based idea. I think also within our culture today, we, we really have uh, shied away from institutions. I don't know if you noticed that. I won't pick on millennials. I know we have a few millennials here, but millennials are actually much more likely to go to a church than to ever join a church or attend a church because of their kind of worry about institutions. And maybe rightfully so. Institutions haven't always been great. Uh, I shared with you a statistic probably a while ago already, but even as far as church membership goes, the United States has been a a Christian nation for a long time, but ever since they've been keeping track of how many Americans belong to, like a member of a church, um, we now for the first time are less than 50% of the U.S. are members of of churches. And and, and it's not just the millennials, but it's the boomers also who are leaving in droves. And and maybe even rightfully so, because not always have institutions treated us well. I think that that sometimes drives us away from it. But understand, God's design from the very beginning, despite what we think of it, is that God has called us to be a, to be a, a child of God, and also made us a part of our church. From the very beginning, he has done this for a very important reason. Whenever you look through the pages of Scripture, what you also see that God works through his church with his glory and his power in a much bigger way than than he does for individuals. I'll give you another example. When when God's glory came down on Mount Sinai, uh, he said, this is what I want to do. I want a place where my glory can reside so I can do more than just an individual. So he said, make it tabernacle. And so God's glory came down in that tabernacle. Later on, he said, make a temple. And God's glory came down 
in the temple. Later on, even on the Sunday of Pentecost, we're going to celebrate that next Sunday. On that first day, as the Spirit came down, 3,000 joined the church that day. God's glory and power works through his corporate people, not just a building, but a group of people that he has called as his own. Even throughout history, we see this. At one point, he took a little guy by the name of Martin Luther and, and, and brought a reformation out of it. His power came down on those who were changed by the gospel of Christ. Uh, a more modern illustration, I don't know if you knew this, but the country of Korea in 1900s was about 1% Christian. And there was a couple of faithful Christians that came together, spread God's word, and in the year 2000, a third of Korea is now Christian. Right? So God's power works in this corporate setting for those of us who have been changed by the gospel of Christ. And, and I think that, that becomes important for us as well. Even, even as we take a look at uh, having gone through COVID, we, I think we realize the importance of being a part of a group of Christians as opposed to on our own. Nowadays, you can watch a hundred sermons throughout the week, right? You can pick and choose and see any pastor that you want to because you can watch it all online. And yet, it's different when you come and worship together. Uh, there was a pastor by the name of, of, of Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was a Protestant preacher back in the 50s, rather popular at the time. And right at that time, they were trying to get him to go on television and on radio, and he didn't want to do it. And one of the reasons, he thought, is that everybody watched the television and on the radio and listened to the radio. No one would go to church anymore. Well, it didn't happen that way. But he said the other reason was because for sermons that are preached in church, it's, it's not just a product, right? We're not just producing a sermon, but it is participation with one another as we have come together. And, and this is what Peter is talking about, that we have been called through faith, but also a part of a people. And the reason is so that God's power and grace can be worked through a group of people to declare the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his glorious sight. Look at what he says in just these last two verses of verse 9 and 10. See, faith is never selfish. It's not just about us, but it's about those he has called us together with. Here's what he, here's what he says. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, the, the, the radical part of God's grace is this. He has called us who are sinful to be his people. He has called us a chosen people, a royal priesthood, right? He has called us with his grace that is boundless, with his love that knows no end. And the cost of that is what makes us belong and has forgiven our sins. I, I give you just one final illustration. Verse 10, you probably should have quotation marks around it because what what Peter does is he takes this right out of the Old Testament book of Hosea. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Uh, Hosea was an Old Testament prophet. He was a contemporary of Isaiah. Uh, God had made his chosen people on Mount Sinai and said, if you obey me, then you're going to be my people. And Israel did a terrible job Throughout their history in the Old Testament, they rarely obeyed God and they were rebellious all the way through. Probably not a lot different than we are today. And so God sent his prophets in order to uh, call them back and just remind them of who they were. Hosea was an interesting one. His calling was this. God said, Hosea, I want you to be a prophet of the Lord, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use your life as an example to my people. And he had Hosea marry a lady by the name of Gomer. And Gomer was an unfaithful wife. And so Gomer produced three children to Hosea, none of which were Hosea's. Now get this, the first child that was born to Gomer and Hosea was named the destruction of Israel. What if you had your first daughter and you named her the destruction of Israel? Not, not a real, not high on the top ten names, right? Yeah. Now, later on, the next son that was born, now this is important because the Lord talks about this, the next son to be born of Hosea. Read through Hosea if you want to. This is another great, great Old Testament prophet. The next one was named Lo-Ruhamah, 
which means you are not loved. Could you imagine your second child naming them, you are not loved? And the third child, the third son that was born, was named not my people, right? Lo ami, yeah, yeah. Now imagine, now th this is what God wanted to do. And it, it gets a little dark. Hosea then, uh, it, it, the, the laws of marriage in the Old Testament were very specific and God was very serious about them. And the ultimate penalty for someone who was unfaithful was death. So instead of death, Hosea then sold off his wife into servitude. Can you imagine this? And, and after he did that, God said, okay, here's now what I want you to do. Hosea, go back. I want you to buy your wife back, redeem your wife with the top dollar. I want you to make her your wife again. And here is why. <laughs> because this is exactly what I am going to do for my people who have been unfaithful, who have not been loved, who are not my people, but I will redeem them and now call them my own. Now, for Peter to write those words here to us as Christians mean that exactly what God had promised in the Old Testament, he did. <laughs> he paid the cost of unfaithful mankind to be his own children, to call us together, to now he can call us his family in the Lord, and the cost was his son, Jesus Christ. Now, does that not give you a sense of, of wonder of love, of appreciation for the cost that God paid that he might be able to call us his people, a royal family, royal priesthood in the Lord. Here's how it applies then. I think it's very true that if you have, it's very difficult to not be selfish if you've never been loved selflessly. And I think as we look at the love of God, what that reminds us is that someone loved us so much in spite of ourselves that we are now called his people. That gives us that motivation to love others as well. When God's people are motivated by God's love and surrounded by God's people and have the sacraments of our Lord and the word of God, there is so much that God's glory can do through us. And so know that you belong. And let us continue to do the work of the Lord that we might declare his praises both here and throughout the world. You belong. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. This morning as we come into the house of God, let's join together in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And we're going to join together in singing the uh, Keith and Kristen Getty version of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find that on page 9 in your bulletin.
offering this morning, feel free to put it in the offering plate on in, by the, at the entrance to the sanctuary. You can either do that now or at any time. Uh, also, if you're a guest or a visitor with us this morning, please feel free to fill out one of those connection cards on the back of the pew. If anyone has a prayer request that they'd like to include in the prayer of the church today, you can also put that on the back of that connection card and uh, get that either to the usher or put it into the offering plate and we'll make that a part of our prayers. Uh, as we... Uh, as we bring our offerings today, uh, our musicians will give to us a musical offering. Feel free to use that time to go to your Lord in prayer.
we pray. <clears throat> oh God, our Heavenly Father, our rock and our fortress, our joy and our salvation, we bring you nothing but thanks and praise for you have called us through faith in Christ, making us citizens in your eternal kingdom, as well as giving us belonging here on earth with the people that you have surrounded us will, with. Lord, we pray that you would preserve us in our faith and fill us with the fruits of righteousness. Make us living letters of your Son. Lord, today we also come before you and we pray for all of those that need you in their defense, in their homes, in, as shelters, for those who are suffering afflictions. We pray, Lord, for those who are sorrowful. We pray for those who need you to be their guide in their life. We especially ask today, Lord, that you would watch over uh, the family of Casia as their family has passed away. Bring them comfort and grace, knowing that in you they, there is eternal life. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Zelmi and her family as well as they, as they mourn the passing of her father. Remind them all of the sacrifice of your son that has made eternal life available to us all. In the midst of their sorrow, dry their eyes that they may know the joy of your salvation. Allow us, as we are able, to lift them up in prayer and in encouragement during this difficult time. Lord, we also come before you with prayer and praise for all of the things that you have blessed us, even in this congregation, with. We pray, Lord, your thanks for a good report from the oncologist for Bonnie. We thank you for a successful surgery and a good outcome for myself. We thank you, Lord, that although Louise Flower was in the hospital this weekend, she is heading home today. We thank you for your love, for your guidance, for your healing, your, for your protection, for all the work of your hand through the doctors and the nurses that attend us. Lord, we also come before you today and we realize that your grace continues to roll out into all the world. And so we put into your special care all of our pastors and our teachers, those who have recently graduated and are assigned to new schools, those who have recently graduated and will be assigned to new churches. Lord, give them the zeal of David and the wisdom of Solomon and the grace of your Son that the world may know of your goodness and your grace wherever they are assigned and wherever they work for you, Lord. Lord, we, we pray that you would accept all of the sacrifices of a broken spirits and contrite hearts and give us your grace and your truth and the saving knowledge of our Redeemer. We ask this in Jesus' name, and in his name we pray, amen. And let us join together in the prayer our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And now, brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, let's close our worship and lift our voices one more time in praise to our Lord in the words of, Oh, how good it is, hymn number 731 in our hymn books. Let's join together in singing, Oh, how good it is. 